Hello, and thank you for joining our session here at WP Campus 2021. Um, we're here today to talk a little bit about how Harvard University utilized the redesign project for our flagship homepage website to sort of practice what we preach in terms of producing a best practice example of inclusive, accessible experience design. So uh, a little bit about ourselves. My name is Aaron Baker. I'm the Associate Director of Content Strategy for Harvard Public Affairs and Communications. Uh, right now I'm in Cambridge, Massachusetts, but I spend time in Mexico City, Mexico, and uh, I'll just let everyone introduce themselves. Hello, my name is Melissa Lessica. I'm the Director of Content Strategy at Harvard, and I'm calling in today from Holliston, Massachusetts, a town about 25 miles from Boston. Hi there, I'm Janelle Sims. I uh, use she, her pronouns. I'm the digital accessibility consultant with Harvard University Information Technology. I'm calling in from Arlington, Mass, which is right next door to Cambridge. Hi, everyone. I'm Kyle Unziker. I use he, him, his pronouns. I'm the creator director at an agency called Modern Tribe. We partnered with Harvard to design and build the new harvard.edu. And I'm calling from Princeton, Illinois. It's a rural town about a couple hours outside of Chicago. Cool. So in our presentation today, we're going to start about um, talking about Harvard and Harvard University and how in the past some events at Harvard really focused our views um, on accessibility and how we approach best practices today. Um, I would put our current chapter in Harvard's history as one that starts with this adoption of uh, digital accessibility policy. So we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about the events that led up to that policy and how um, and, and what impacted that and how the redesign project played a role in all of this. We'll talk a little bit about how we selected a vendor to do this redesign. We'll talk about our design and build process itself and, and how we incorporated accessibility all along the way. We'll go over a few future highlights, some of our favorites. And then um, we'll talk about how we're going to approach maintenance and sustainability in the future for this project and where we go from here. So a little background. If you work in higher education at all, you know that institutions are really either centralized or decentralized. And I guess mostly, most institutions in higher education are pretty decentralized or they, they skew that way. And certainly Harvard is no exception. Harvard is very decentralized. And decentralization is the reason we can't count how many websites we have at Harvard or, or know who takes care of them in a centralized fashion. And in the past, accessibility efforts were uncoordinated because there really wasn't anybody in the center of the organization to guide the process along or to get everybody on board. And I think that situation led to an unnecessary, led to many unnecessary arguments about what the right thing to do versus what's the required thing to do in terms of accessibility. And people get, especially, you know, with topics on access and inclusivity, people get really heated. And so that's why, um, and I think that's pretty normal. I think it's just in the past, uh, many people at Harvard and many other higher education institutions, um, they sort of worry about accessibility because you think you might get sued. And, and here, well, we're no longer worried about that possibility because we actually did get sued. That's right. In 2015, the National Association of the Deaf filed a lawsuit against Harvard. Um, the, D the DOJ contended that universities, um, including Harvard, were discriminating against deaf individuals by failing to provide equal access in the form of captions. Um, that lawsuit was settled in 2019, but not before revealing some pretty significant organizational issues that um, Aaron has alluded to. Well, fortunately, in April of 2019, Harvard announced that it was going to be adopting a digital accessibility policy. Um, and this was great news for everybody, but especially for advocates like me and Aaron and Melissa, who were already working to bring awareness about accessibility across the university. We were thrilled that we were finally going to have a policy that we could point to to encourage people to make their websites accessible. Um, the policy went into effect December 1st of 2019, 
And it says that all new Harvard websites and new content created after December 1st needs to meet the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines or WCAG, WCAG, uh, version 2.1 conformance level AA. Um, the policy established a new Digital Accessibility Services Team, or DAS, D-A-S, and it also created a network of liaisons across the entire university. Um, and this has been critical because, as we just discussed, Harvard is very decentralized. Um, I know that's not uncommon among higher ed. So having this network of liaisons means there's someone representing each school and area who can coordinate local accessibility efforts and then report back and share their progress. So Digital Accessibility Services, or DAS, is a dedicated team of developers and consultants. Um, I'm thrilled to be a consultant on the team. I've worked at Harvard for a long time, but it was a real honor for me to be able to join DAS and work with people across Harvard. Um, DAS supports leadership in creating and sustaining a culture of commitment to accessibility. So we really want to empower managers and leaders to encourage their staff to prioritize accessibility. We provide training and guidance to content creators, developers, and project managers so they have everything they need to be able to create and implement accessible content. And what's so interesting about the services that DAS is providing is their new offerings to the Harvard community, although a lot of these efforts had actually already been happening across the university. People like Aaron and Melissa and myself were doing these kind of activities, but all alone, all by ourselves, creating our own trainings, providing guidance as best we could, um, but it was on top of our regular duties. So the DAS team really formalized all of those efforts. So now there's a full-time team that's supported by the university, much more able to provide those resources, really just alleviates the burden of the individual people that were trying to do it all themselves. I think everyone on this call agrees that accessibility is fundamental and foundational to our work. But for this principle to be true, most oftentimes it, and successful, it oftentimes has to be modeled at the top. Um, at Harvard, we were fortunate that our president, Larry Bacow, came out with a pretty compelling statement saying, Harvard is deeply committed to expanding access to knowledge, information, and learning opportunities for people with disabilities. So at least one of the most complicating factors in achieving this goal, getting buy-in from executive level, was easy for us. Leadership was already on board. Um, but taking a step beyond this at Harvard, we wanted to frame accessibility in the broader diversity, inclusion, and belonging initiative. So it would make it even more difficult for even the biggest skeptic or naysayer to say no. Um, so, Bringing it back to harvard.edu, when we were thinking about relaunching this property, we really wanted to be ambitious. The goal was to build a beautiful and accessible website. Um, we wanted to push our colleagues at Harvard and perhaps even the broader industry of higher ed to do better. Basic accessibility was already being modeled by our social channels. Starting in 2019, we put in place a policy that the only school or department content that the main channels would share or retweet would, be, would need to have high quality and accessible. That proved a huge incentive for people to pay attention on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube to alt text and other um, captioning. We wanted to bring those same practices to the web. Um, this, because above all else, this was, Har this was Harvard's flagship website and the first major property, property to be launched after the policy. It was incumbent upon us to embody the letter, but maybe more importantly, the spirit of the digital accessibility policy. It was really a public test for Harvard to get this right and think holistically about what a great experience should be for all site visitors. We really could only do that by being in alignment with DAS and our diversity, inclusion, and belonging office. Um, exactly. I love what Melissa just said about the spirit of the policy, um, because with that intention to create a truly inclusive website, we wanted to make sure that we weren't just designing to the standards. We really wanted to go above and beyond and set an example for the rest of the university. So accessibility standards were basically our floor and not the ceiling. So they were the baseline of where we started from, not what we were striving for. 
I think a lot of times accessibility requirements can be seen as the ceiling, like as long as we meet these standards, we're all set, done, check, never have to think about it again. The problem with this sort of checkbox compliance is that people will always try to find a way around the rule. And sometimes even if you meet the standards, the product might still be unusable. Um, the image here shows that someone may have installed a ramp and a pedestrian crossing check, but they didn't bother to account for the giant concrete island running through the middle of it, making the crossing completely unusable for someone in a wheelchair or using a cane, pushing a stroller, or just anyone who wants to walk on a flat surface. Um, so we didn't want to build a site that just met the policy requirements. We wanted to push the industry further and set an even higher standard for ourselves and the larger Harvard community. We found that when you see how your product affects someone who has a disability, that can really help build empathy and provide more incentive to make it accessible. I'm going to talk a little bit more about how we went through uh, the various processes to go through this redesign. So a little backstory, before we jumped right into design and build, we actually devoted an, a whole phase of the project to user research. And we used that impetus to sort of inform how we wanted to write our request even for uh, the proposal to go about vendor selection. So it's really important that we did some of this pre-work before we went into vendor selection because that helped us identify the language we needed to write in, in looking for a vendor partner. So in um, just a little um, information about our team, we don't have um, developers on staff, we have uh, vendor partners and um, we so because we only work with third party contractors it's really important for us to get the language in these rfps really correct we knew like we only had one shot at getting you know an agency on board so we take this step really really seriously because it's kind of a gamble right you're trying to find the best fit and um where we learned from this research phase that we needed to work on the language and we needed to work on the aesthetic you know things needed to have that harvard look and we figured a lot of notable agencies would, you know, really want to jump on this project, but we really wanted to find somebody who would, um, was a leader in terms of accessibility. So we were looking for vendors. We listed our guiding principles, and we have a link in, uh, to this document, and you see part of it here on your screen. Um, but when you see that, when you read the RFP, you'll find that in one of our guiding principles, we said that, you know, Harvard's new website must meet WCAG 2.1. And then we go on to say that we expect this site to serve as a model for web accessibility because we're not playing around, right? We knew that, that at Harvard, people expect the best and they expect that this website needs to be a standard bearer. We have a reputation to uphold. And so we need, when, when people say, what does a higher education website look like? They, they visit harvard.edu and we want them to say, when people, when you ask somebody, what does an accessible website look like? We want them to also go to harvard.edu. So we really just wanted to put that out there. And uh, we got a lot of feedback from this RFP process. We got a lot of vendors right in, um, but one stood above the rest and Modern Tribe actually wrote in their proposal to us, hey, we hear you. We heard you want an accessible website and guess what? Accessibility is really important to us. And that got our attention more than anything else. They're obviously, um, you know, top of class vendor as far as like higher ed websites go, but it was their attention to accessibility that really got our attention. And um, they showed us in their examples of their work, it's in their culture. Um, so yeah, well, Kyle, what do you think? What it, <laughs> yeah, What's on your mind when, when it comes to accessibility? Sure. Well, I, I will start by saying, you know, we certainly aren't perfect, but we are absolutely committed and committed to continuing to ensure that the work we create um, is accessible for all. And that commitment isn't something that happened overnight. And it's also a commitment that, that didn't happen by accident. You know, in some cases, we, we had to learn the hard way after shipping code that wasn't as accessible as it should have been, being held accountable by users or, or, or clients. But you know, those experiences have 
allowed us to put in the time and effort to make sure that accessibility isn't just a, a nice to have add on for project or something that's industry specific that only education sites need to be uh, accessible. Rather, we've taken an approach now where accessibility is a baseline necessity for everything we do. And we have implemented a, a few uh, pieces of our, our workflow to ensure um, that that's the case. So first, when we estimate time and cost for projects, we're automatically accounting for accessibility focused development and testing on any feature that has significant front end development or UI development, really anything that's going to be uh, interacted with um, by the user or read by the user. Also, our QA team gets trained on the essentials of both automated accessible accessibility training and manual training, which I know Janelle will talk a little bit about uh, in a little bit. Also, we have an internal framework shared by our developers that sort of consists of years of best practices and learnings that our dev teams can contribute back to. So what this means is if we discover an accessibility function on a project that we think would be useful for all projects, we're able to contribute that back to our framework, making it that much more likely to account for that going forward. So let's talk a little bit about how we incorporated our, our desire to have this model of accessibility website and how we translated that into the, the project itself. And um, before I talked a little bit about how we had this entire research phase and what we learned from that. We did a competitive audit. We looked at other schools' websites. We did user interviews. We did ethnographic studies. We did content and message testing. And all of that is really important. I encourage everybody to incorporate those kinds of things into any redesign process. But you know, you think that language, um, that the language that you produce is going to be accessible because you want it to be, but it really takes a step where you sort of meet real people and see how they react to language. This is why you need this sort of qualitative testing in your regime. For Harvard, it, it's hard not to seem stuffy, right? It's hard not to write something that seems really boastful when good things are always happening or research is really exciting and there's really smart people around. So we had to take a step back and really learn how to make our language more accessible because that makes the university more approachable. Um, and again, accessibility is not a checkbox, right? This is just like sort of a process that you sort of have to refine and refine until you, you get it into your bones like oh i can't write that way it's not accessible you really have to expand your worldview to incorporate um, the perspectives of different people this is why we look at accessibility not just as a as a in terms of access and assistive technology but we see accessibility as as a part of diversity and inclusion and belonging how can somebody belong at your school if they can't use your website so we take this really seriously and we got the people in our diversity and inclusion and belonging office involved and they were really excited to work with us as well. We wanted to um, use this redesign project to change the way we write about Harvard on the web page. You know, you'll notice a lot more first person narratives and we want, really wanted to center people in our content and in our process. So I think that that's how we see that accessibility can play a part in more than just the technical side of the, pro of the project. So when we uh, set out to begin designing and planning what the new site would entail, um, we really set out as a group to have an accessibility first mindset in every phase that we could, whether it be design, development, QA, and one of the things that helped establish this is the goals that Harvard clearly articulated up front. Uh, if you're looking at this slide, that left column is literally the goals that were provided in the RFP. And as you can see, we've highlighted the one around the goal of being a model of accessible and user-centric design. Again, not just AA compliant, but that model of accessible design. And we really took that to heart and started to think about how that might be achieved. And a lot of the ideas we generated required nothing radical. And in fact, a lot of these sort of accessibility first uh, 
uh, goals, they read a lot like broad user first um, uh, aspects. So for instance, having straightforward menu labels or including micro copy uh, that gives users additional context, making sure the master doesn't obscure content. These read a lot like you, you know, aspects that anybody would, would benefit, not just users with, with disabilities. So with this mindset, we were able to check our work against accessibility standards from design, ensuring we had proper color contrast, hierarchy, legibility, to again, testing our pages and features in the browser manually with automated tools, as well as giving content creators even more tools to ensure that they're creating accessible content that may exist out of the box within WordPress. And we'll talk about a little bit about some of those specific features in a little bit. When it came to approach the visual design, I, I'm sure that any designer would be that thrilled at the, the opportunity to, to redesign a, a new website for Harvard. Um, and that was absolutely the case here. Um, I, there's a misconception that I think is, thankfully or hopefully uh, waning a bit uh, in design circles that designing an accessible, accessible site means that it can limit how beautiful it can be or that it pigeonholes you into a certain aesthetic. You know, some people might think of, oh, it has to be yellow caution tape everywhere, high contrast mode only. For us, accessibility is no more a design constraint than mobile design or responsive design, right? I think the, the shared aspect here is it's about providing a capable based design system that focuses on designing for different types of content and then making targeted decisions on how to present that content based off of how the user might interact with your site. As I mentioned before, during our sort of visual concepting phase, beyond ensuring proper color contrast, our internal vetting process, you know, we also ask questions around legibility, hierarchy, and even as Aaron said before, tone. Questions that aim to create a better user experience for all, including those with disabilities. That said, while we did take a sort of broad, inclusive approach overall, we did make a series of targeted decisions that would improve the website specifically for users with disabilities, which we'll dig into in a little bit. So the digital accessibility team was really happy to step in and help with accessibility testing in every phase of the process. Um, this was the first big project that we got pulled into so early. So instead of waiting until like right before launching, um, we were able to test in the early design phases with wireframes. Um, we tested as features were being implemented, even if they weren't completely polished. And then we also worked with the vendors, QA and developers to make sure that the final pass met those accessibility standards as well. Um, we use both automated and manual testing, and that's so important because automated testing really only finds about 20 to 25% of issues. Um, now, those issues are usually critical, so it's important to do that automated testing as a first pass, um, but you really need to follow that up with a manual review to get that full and complete assessment. Um, the automated tools we used were Site Improve, Wave, Axe, a whole bunch of other browser extensions. Um, the manual methods we used were keyboard only testing, screen reader review, and manual content check. Um, and as Kyle mentioned, Tribe had been doing their own testing throughout the project. So our team didn't really have to waste time logging like simple color contrast or alt text issues. So instead we had more time to really focus on enhancing the experience for all users and especially for users with disabilities. And then you can do all the accessibility testing and review you want. But if you don't actually document it in a meaningful way that provides actionable feedback, it's not really going to be much of a help. So we created a report that was also a way of communicating with the vendors so they'd be able to very easily understand and implement the issues we were documenting. Um, the DAS team has developed our own template that we use for tracking accessibility issues. So we were able to use that same template to provide specific information about each issue and then mapped those issues to the WCAG criteria so that the developers could find more information about each issue if they needed it. 
Um, we've provided guidance on how to fix the issue and then prioritize those issues based on impact and relevance. We also use the spreadsheet for commenting in collaboration with uh, QA and developers. Since we were using this Google spreadsheet, it was really easy to go back and forth. So this you know, also made the whole project process more collegial, not adversarial at all. Um, so it wasn't like we were going through and being like, oh, this is terrible, what were you thinking? Instead, we were helping them see issues they may not have noticed and also just providing guidance on how to fix them. So here's a screenshot of a snippet of the spreadsheet that we use. So don't try to read it. I know it's tiny, but um, just wanted to give you like a high level view of what something like this could look like if you wanted to try to try it out for yourself. Uh, we had various columns identifying where exactly each issue was occurring on the page and what the issue was. We added screenshots or code snippets. Um, and then added some notes, and then the QA and developers were able to add their own notes as well. So it really just made it so easy to go back and forth and understand which issues were being worked on. Um, at the end of the presentation, we've actually included a link to this template on the DAS website in case you'd like to download it and try it out for yourself. So I mentioned before we give uh, a little bit of uh, insights on some specific uh, accessibility focused uh, features that we implemented. So this was a WordPress site. Uh, this is WB Campus, so it'd be weird if it wasn't. Uh, and we uh, loved working with the Gutenberg editor and we introduced, I don't know, maybe a, a dozen or so custom blocks on, on top of um, what we get with Gutenberg. And I just wanna highlight one block and how that has multiple opportunities to create it more accessible. So what we're looking at here is a hero block. You can, uh, we knew that uh, Harvard was gonna come to the table with great content to design around and great multimedia that we could we could leverage and so uh, we see here, see here it, it's a common pattern but it's it's a it can be really impactful this full screen sort of background video and first you can see that uh, you know we've highlighted a pause button here um, you know Anything that's auto playing uh, can be distracting for site visitors with attention deficiencies or people with sensory issues related to moving content. So because this was an auto playing video, we wanted to make sure that we offered that pause button for users. And actually, if you wanna talk about guidelines, this is a level A guideline. I know background videos are, are pretty common and I see them all the time without pause buttons. So if you have a site using this without the pause button, I do recommend uh, looking into this. A couple other pieces within this block is you can see we have text over the, the video and um, we knew that we wanted to leverage text over images and video, but that's something you do have to be cautious of with accessibility. You wanna make sure that the, the text is legible. So we knew that we would be providing an overlay over the image to darken it. Um, and actually we, for many of these blocks, we have a light mode and a dark mode. So you could actually switch from a dark overlay to a light overlay, the text would change to black, it, it's pretty cool. But within this overlay, we gave a sort of a gradation of options for editors to make the overlay milder or stronger, depending on the, the sort of brightness of the, the media behind it. Finally, um, this hero block can also support um, a sort of primary call to action uh, link. And anytime we were uh, introducing call to action opportunities within the blocks, uh, we wanted to make sure that the editor was able to specify sort of a separate screen reader label uh, when appropriate in case that the button's action or purpose um, wasn't easily identifiable. One of my favorite uh, features is um, focus indicators. I think that a lot of times people go through uh, redesign projects and they don't design the focus indicator and then they end up having to add one after the fact because it's really crucial for keyboard only users. Um, so you know you need it, right? Like design for it. <laughs> and it's so easy if you just did this at the beginning, like it's like what Janelle was saying, like bring your accessibility team in at the beginning because they can give you some of these pointers. But the focus indicator doesn't have to be a distraction. It can be designed, it can have a nice color, it can go with the rest of the site. 
And as you tab through and the focus changes, it should be obvious, but it also shouldn't be distracting. So the content's not wiggling around because now things all of a sudden have a border they didn't have before. You know, it, it was designed purposefully. Um, we liked it from the beginning. So it wasn't something we had to like add on after the fact and, and feel grumpy about. Like, don't feel grumpy about it. Designed for keyboard only users, they exist. When Tribe first introduced this um, feature, I was super excited, um, not only for the simplified navigation, which was a major pain point of the previous site, but more on that later. Um, this was really intuitive, an intuitive solve for collapsing a navigation or reversing direction when tabbing through content with the escape key. Um, it's just one example of how accessibility really enhances the experience for all because I use this command every day. Um, and so, like Melissa just said, the, the navigation was one of the main improvements of the site. Um, so I'm just going to give you a quick example. Um, on the old site, there were lots of different main sections in the global nav, um, but to get to each of those sections with the keyboard or screen reader, you had to go through literally every single sub item, which took a really long time and was super annoying. Um, the new global nav is much more consolidated, so you're able to jump from section to section without having to tab through every item. Um, so I'm just gonna play you a quick demo of a screen reader reading, reading through the old site and then the new one. Um, and I'm not a super, super screen reader user, so I think it's mine's at like 45%, not like 90, like an expert, but. <laughs> Hopefully you'll be able to understand it a little better. Link, Harvard University, banner. You are currently on a heading level one, visited, link, about Harvard, list two items, link, Harvard at a glance, list eight items level two, link, Harvard's press, link, Harvard's leadership, link, 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 admissions and eight, list two items, link, undergraduate, list four items level two, link, 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 schools, list two items. Cringeworthy, right? <laughs> not great. Um, so not only is it annoying to have to tab through every item, um, sounds like maybe the sections weren't label labeled properly. So some lists say four items, even though there are only two. Um, so now let's hear the news, what it's like to uh, experience the new site. Open site navigation, collapsed button, academics, collapsed button list six items, link, explore all programs, Academics, group, Harvard schools, collapsed button list four items, link, professional and lifelong learning, link, free online courses, link, more about academics at Harvard, campus, collapsed button list six items, in focus, collapsed button. Um, so you probably heard that the, the new site has items collapsed. Sorry about that, <laughs> um, which just makes it so much easier to um, to jump from one item to the next. I think anyone that's been involved with um, any kind of web redesign really understands that the launch is the beginning of the work. Um, so how we sustain the site and where we go from here will really determine the success of this project. So the project really helped solidify the relationship with the content strategy team and the DAS team. Um, so DAS now provides trainings, office hours, consultations, um, all the things the content strategy team was having to do on their own. Um, we found that it's important to train the content editors too, um, because you can build this beautiful accessible site, but when people start adding content, that's where issues can start to pop up. Um, in fact, within the first few weeks of launching the site, we received a report that there was an issue with the background video and the text being too light, so it was hard to read. Um, and even though Tribe had implemented that those cover, color over, overlay options that Kyle mentioned, um, the content editor hadn't noticed that and had unintentionally created a color contrast issue on the homepage. Um, but we were able to quickly work with Melissa and Aaron to add in an admin check. Um, so before anything is now published on the homepage, they do a color contrast check to make sure that the text and background video have sufficient contrast. So I think part of the success of the, this relationship is that 
all the editors on harvard.edu um, view DAS as essential partners to ensure that all site visitors can access the vast material we publish every week. Um, editors are really excited by these topics, stories, materials, and we wanna make sure everyone can participate in the experiences that we're designing. Um, one of the biggest challenges in my experience with content editors is uh, that need to get beyond the initial defensiveness of when an accessibility issue is flagged. No one likes to hear that something they produce is wrong, um, but we're fortunate that our team has years of experience. Um, and especially through this process, we really want to get it right. Um, and to be on it, to be honest, really, um, Two years after the settlement, I think that's the general feeling among most um, site owners at Harvard. People just really want to get it right. Um, what's great about DAS is that we can operationalize accessibility through professional development. Um, since the launch in February, our team members have participated in additional trainings and will continue to do so because things change and we really want to remain at the forefront. I know everyone um, on this call can look at harvard.edu and and be proud of what we've produced. Um, you may look at it and, and quickly realize that the content strategy and the content available on harvard.edu is very Harvard specific. It won't work for every brand. Um, but the accessibility lessons here, those are something that every brand, big or small, um, can utilize and implement. So whatever your strategy, whatever your institution, just remember there are people there that want accessibility to happen. They just might need a little help getting there. And that's what this is about. We have not met anyone at Harvard who thought accessibility was a bad idea. We've only met countless of other people saying, that's awesome what you're doing. Can you help us get there as well? And that's what we're trying to do today. Thanks for joining us for this presentation. Um, thank you to Kyle from Modern Tribe for sticking with us through this whole project and delivering a beautiful website for us. Um, thank you to Janelle, our partner in digital accessibility support services. Um, and we're going to stick around in this presentation to answer questions. Um, we're available through social networks. If you're seeing this not in real time, please reach out to us. We would love to talk to you, help you on your own journey uh, and your institution on making accessibility the norm. Thanks again.